quickly to Adrian Hill. She is a powerhouse. This woman is freaking amazing. I found her uh, years ago, and um, she was one of my. She found me. <laughs> so she found me because I run a Wikipedia, just this tiny Wikipedia organization called Girl Skeptics on Wikipedia that I will be talking about later. She found me from there, and then we found that. Oh hi. We found her that she's um, that uh, Adrian has just become one of those doers, and Mark is here, and his class is here. You, Mark, four of your class members are here. I just want to let you know. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the students showed up. You're the teacher. That's all right. So what we're going to do is I'm going to hand this off to Adrian. Adrian is going to be talking two, two talks today. Please don't miss them. They're both amazing, and they have nothing to do with each other. And this one is one I commissioned from her and told her to do. And I think she will be talking about that later. If she has time for questions, we're going to ask that she use the microphone when you talk. And the microphone is here. We'll hand it off to you. Or we'll repeat your question because we want to make sure we have this nice and clear for our videos. All right? Thank you guys so much. And welcome to Skeptic Camp 2024.
To this day, the Winchester Mystery House remains one of the most haunted places in North America and the world. Just Google it. It is listed <laughs> as being one of the most haunted houses. It's quite funny. So how many of you have heard of this story? Okay, most of you. And how many of you believe part of it? That she was crazy, that she was guilt-ridden, that she was a tad, you know, tad-crazy, reclusive, superstitious. How many of you believe that? I did until I heard it. Until, until I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, everyone's like, oh, yeah, she did. So we're going to teach you, we're going to educate you today. And so, yeah, how many of you believe I already asked that? So how did I start with this? First of all, I listened to Skip Toy episode 824 with Brian and Diane. So if you don't know who that is, write it down, take a picture, and do listen to this podcast. It's short, so if you have a short attention span like I do, this is a really great one because it's only usually about 10, 15 minutes long. And he talked about the Winchester Mystery House, and he also got in contact with our favorite fearless leader, Susan Nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and she... <laughs> <laughs> Her father-in-law and her husband. 
and will die from tuberculosis, which is going to come up again a little bit later. And at this time, Sally was not that young. I think she was about 40 when this happened. So in those times, it was she was you know, getting up there. And she had bad health issues herself. She had terrible rheumatoid, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which she was running in the valley, ran in her family. And she decided to move to California, likely on her doctor's advice, uh, not on some spiritualist. And she decided to move there also because there was a lot of advertising at the time that portrayed California as being the place to move in the United States. The weather, the soil, you could grow things. So it really sounded attractive to her, as well as it was not as humid where she was planning to move from as it was in New Haven. And also, she had visited San Francisco with her husband several times, and it was always a positive experience. So she had really fond memories of being in California. So the next correction is the name of the house. She actually did have a name, and it was never called the Manchester Mystery House until after she died, and very quickly after she died. And she called it, and I'm going to say it the Spanish way, so I know it's probably in, in California, you wouldn't be said pronounced Yena Villa, but in Spain, because she named it after a place in Spain, it would be Yena Villa, and I'm probably still not saying it correct, so I apologize. And she brought as much of her family as she could, so all of her sisters actually moved out with her, and she supported them financially all their lives. So she's quite an amazing woman. And she decided to renovate this home that she bought, and became the project manager and chief architect of it. And this is a natural progression. Why did she choose to take this on? Well, when she was living in New Haven with her husband, they both were very interested in architecture and interior design. And they oversaw together the construction and design of the brand new home in the New Haven area. And they hired architects there, and she tried to hire people when she moved to California, but it was still growing. The, you know, the, the kind of professions that were here were not really established. She wasn't happy with them. So she decided, why not? I'll do it myself. And she did. So she was should be considered, actually, as an architectural pioneer. And unfortunately, this independence resulted in rumors of her being irrational, superstitious, mainly because the project was kept on going on and on. It took her a long time. She was learning as she was going along. And when Sally died in 1922, the house was in such disrepair, we're going to talk more about why that was later on, it actually couldn't be sold. So John and Mamie Brown leased it, then eventually purchased the home a few years later, turning it into an attraction, expanding upon the lore and mystery of Sarah Winchester. And the attraction was opened only nine months after her death, and it's been open ever since. So what resources did I use? Did I use the Winchester Mystery House Souvenir Guides? <laughs> There's two of the pictures. One of them was Susan gave me. It's an older version. And the one that is in the background is one I have a hard time getting. They were all sold out of them. I kept trying to buy the 100 year anniversary. It was the 100 year anniversary of last year. And I finally got one around Canadian Thanksgiving. <laughs> and here it is, so I used this and I looked at it, and at SciPod I ran into Brian Dunning, and he, he said to me, well, they're not still giving those tours and talking about the ghosts, etc. I mean, this has been known for a while, and I'm like, yeah, according to the brand new souvenir guide that I got, yeah, they're still, they're doing little, so it takes them out, and they've added some more. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So I'm really hoping to see a lot of you at that tour tomorrow. So, now they like to couch a lot of the ghost stories now. They've progressed a little bit. They've changed their language so that they like to have questions. They're just questioning. So one of the things they say, why did Sally, this is right, right at the end, by the very end of this book, why did Sally spend so much time, money, and energy to live the way she did? Was she obsessed by the ghosts of those killed by the Winchester rifle? No one will ever know the answer. <laughs> And that's how the book finishes, and which is totally untrue, because all I had to do is go and read this person's book. And it came out in 2010, and a new one came out last year, uh, a revised edition. She added more information, more pictures. If you want to learn more about this woman and her family, it's a fascinating story. I really recommend you pick this book.
go out. And, and so there's not a lot of excuse. I mean, this has been around for a long time. Also, so how many of you know this person? Joan Nickel. Yeah, lots of people oh, know this person. Yeah. <laughs> Susan said she took that picture. There you go. And he has been writing about the myths versus the reality of the Winchester Mystery House for years. He even did an article early 2000s, 2002, which was called Winchester Mystery House, Fact versus Fiction. The information has been out there. He also wrote about the house and Sally multiple times in several books. And this is a fun one. How many of you have seen the movie, the 2018 movie called Winchester? Oh, oh what person? Did you yeah. like it? Two? Three? How did you like it? Yeah. Yeah, not very good? Yeah, it, it had uh, Helen Mirren, I think is her name. Yeah, Mirren Mirren, yeah, Helen Mirren, and she portrayed Sally, so well known actress. But that's how she was portrayed. Crazy, paranoid, eccentric, you know, the whole works. And the movie, I was really excited to hear this, the movie was nominated for many 2019 Golden Raspberry Awards <laughs> for the worst picture, actress, director, and screenplay. So we have a lot of them. Check out the Wikipedia pages, that's where I found this. And best of all, Joe Nickel gave him his own rating. And it was one with nickel out of four. So <laughs> I thought that was wonderful. And in the latest edition between the Gerwig edition and the 100th anniversary, they added psychics and ghost hunters into the mix in the manual. So apparently Sylvia Brown and a woman I don't know named Sylvia Brown, everyone know who Sylvia Brown is? Some people was, don't. Sylvia Brown was. 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 Thankfully. Thank you. <laughs> she was a well-known psychic. And look her Wikipedia page up. She has quite a story. She said that a missing person was dead and they weren't. It was quite horrific. And I don't know the sentiment that made, but apparently these two psychics saw great balls of red light in Sarah's bedroom. And Brown also saw two spirits wearing appropriate attire from Sally's time who could have been servants. Psychic investigator Joanne Borden, Borgen sorry, held a seance in the room Sally died in, and Borgen appeared to age visibly in front of everyone, and suddenly she felt pain when she moved. So I guess she all of a sudden had Sarah's arthritis. And James Van Prague, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is that right? Thank you. He uh, was there, and he conducted a seance in the Grand Ballroom in 2016, and again for the 100th anniversary, and I can't remember, it was like 200 bucks or something, wasn't it, for, for the seance? It was quite a lot of money to be charged. And he apparently has done quite a few seances over the years at the Manchester History House. In 2011, the TV show Ghostbusters with Zach Bacon's. How many of you have been? you go to the museum in Las Vegas, right, with Zach Bacon's. In the lead, attempting to, an overnight stay at the house, but they were so overwhelmed with the spirit activity that they left the house in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> they returned in 2016, and guess what? They saw weird stuff. And that's quotes from the guy. They saw weird stuff. All right, in 2017, the Ghostbusters attempted to connect with Sally by one of the team dressed up as Sally. And they sensed a lot of negative energy, apparently, but Sally would not. Oh, I know. It's so sad. All right. Claims versus reality. I love this picture because these are real ghosts, right? They're not. Right? So they're sheets on them. They're real and they're cute and adorable. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to break down the most common stories I've found. So some of them I'm going to leave out. Some of them you may be aware of. And I'm going to contrast these claims, most of which appear in the souvenir books sold by the attraction, but some have just appeared online a lot. So anything that I saw over and over again, I've put in here. And yes, for a change, as I say, pictured here with live ghosts. So the first claim is about her money. This one's always something that comes up. I don't know why. She received $1,000 per day in royalties, and she had a $20 million inheritance. And I've seen some that are higher. I'm going to show you one in a minute that's really fun. But mostly that's what's said. Well, in reality, she received $21 per day. It's a little different. And that was for the first five years after her death. And she, it, her, of course, went up and down because her stocks went up and down. Her shares were, went up and down. And this is nowhere near the claimed inheritance. But even if you think, okay, well, maybe they're accounting for inflation. 
But if you look at that, in 2023 dollars, we're still not close. We're looking at a $2,344,000 inheritance, nowhere near the $20 million. So there's one other possibility I thought it could be, because later in her life, in 1898, she got a $300,000 inheritance from her mother-in-law. And if you add that in and do all the calculations, you're still only at 13,000, just over 13 million things, just over 13 million dollars. And in the latest Miss Winchester mystery book, they put her inflation inheritance at 10 million. So I don't know why these numbers are available. Like they're in Mary Dothel's book, they're very detailed. She went through letters, she went through all the legal stuff. She found what actually she earned. And there's very detailed records of this. So I don't know where they get the numbers from. And then this happened last month, just quite recently actually, on the Wikipedia page, because I created the Wikipedia, not created, I rewrote the Wikipedia page. So apparently her salary was 500 million. So I don't know if that's, I guess that's per year, 500 million. So somebody decided to put that on there. And I guess they just made it up. What happens when something like that occurs on Wikipedia? I want you to take a look at those numbers there. Because there's the timestamp, 1827, 1828. So one minute after that was made, it was reverted by another editor. And that tends to be what happens when Uncited material or vandalism occurs, it gets very quickly reverted. Next claim we have regular seances occurring in the blue room. Sally liked her seances apparently. And unusual for the times, she held them by herself. And sometimes in a closet, why? But in a closet to speak to spirits who guided her regarding her construction projects. And she was seeking spiritual advice. The reality is there is no evidence she ever had any seances. Her staff never said anything. They actually said no, that she didn't. In addition, solo seances just didn't happen at that time. And records actually show what that blue room was. And it was, towards the end of her life, the gardener's bedroom. And earlier on, it was an office for one of the staff members. It was never a seance room. Then she also not only had seances, she had spirit parties, and not the kind of alcohol. It's not the kind of spirit I'm talking about. <laughs> so these are rumored to be lavish parties that she held for the ghosts. In her home with food so served on golden plates that were all kept in her safe. Well, that's a verifiable claim, right? We can find out whether she had these golden plates or not. Well, they opened the safe. Guess what? No golden plates. And all that was in there were some lovely mementos and a lock of her baby's hair. That was it. Next one, this claim is that she was not a churchgoer, and that's why she was into spiritualism, leading her to seek the advice of that medium that I talked about earlier. And often it is written in a lot of articles and think books written about her. It was nicknamed Adam Coons, who convinced her to build a house for the spirits of all the people killed by rifles made by the Winchester. Reality. Between the two places, Connecticut where she lived before and California where she moved to, she was affiliated with a lot of churches. And here's a list of them. All of these churches she donated to, she spent time with, she went to. The other thing is, it is very unlikely that Sally ever felt any guilt about the deaths from Winchester repeating rifles since weapons were not viewed poorly at that time. They were actually considered something you needed for survival. And plus, she remained on the board until I believe the day she died. She wasn't very active, I don't think, when, in her later life, but she was on the board. If she really didn't like what was going on, I think she would not have done that. And extensive research was taken on by multiple people in universities, researchers, etc., looking for Adam Coons, because there's extensive records in the Boston area about the mediums that they had a registry, and they can't find them. There's no evidence that this person ever existed. Is it possible Sally went to a medium at some point in her life? Yeah, sure, she could have. But this story has been exaggerated a lot. And it actually can be traced back when it first started appearing in, in media. And it started appearing in media in 1967 when a woman named Susie Smith 
uh, wrote a book called Prominent American Ghosts, and it's been part of the war ever since. So 1967, so long after she was dead. So I claim she's obviously her reclusive behavior fueled the rumors that and gossip that the newspaper article speculated about her really crazy, odd behavior. And she was thought of as superstitious and mad. But in reality, she had a lot of health issues. She was struggling. She could hardly move. She, it hurt to walk. There's the staircase, I don't really mention this, where it could only go up a little tiny bit. And that was to help her go up the stairs because her arthritis was so painful. She also had a lot of missing teeth, which was pretty common in those times. I don't think you know, they, they speculate. One of the reasons she was reclusive is she didn't like her appearance very much. But that's a speculation, but it seems fairly fair. That one seems reasonable. Not that she was afraid of those. The bell tower. I see this everywhere. And it was used to summon the spirits. And I've seen lots of different times. It's usually summoned at noon, or not noon, midnight. Of course, it has to be that. You never during the day. Has to be midnight and 2 o'clock. She was at two, midnight, she'd bring them in, 2 o'clock, and you can go in now. Reality is, they were, it was used to call the workmen. Okay, it's time to go to work. And their job, for their jobs during the day. And it doubled as a fire alarm if necessary. And this also dispels the myth, and I think I talked about this later, but in case I don't. That round the clock thing? Totally a myth. They actually, that's why, you know, they ring the bell, people going on. Did not work round the clock. Ghostly music was often heard by neighbors during the night. And it's true, ghostly music was heard during the night. Because she liked to play the pump organ because she couldn't sleep because of her pain and her arthritis. So it was a personal play, not a ghost. I like this one. Because I love it. Anyone else have a favorite number being number 13? Just me? I mean, if I could get a play on, on a plane, I'd have to try this. If there's three seats on a plane, go to row 13. And pick either, either one of the outside ones, and almost invariably nobody will pick a seat beside you because nobody likes to buy the, the row 13. I was end up having extra room, so you can uh, try. I'm right then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're true. On a flight recently, I was there and back, I was like, by myself. It was great. Alright, so I love the number 13, so this is one of my favorite ones. There are 13 bathrooms and 13 windows in one bathroom. <laughs> what about the other 12? Um, there are 13 steps on a staircase. But what about the other staircases that have 7, 11, or other number of staircases? I mean, what about those other ones? Chandelier that originally had sorry, 12 candles on it. But there's other things there too in the list. And according to a carpenter, James Perkins, who worked on the property for a lot of years, these things happened after she died, most of them. The first mention of the number 13 was in relation to Yanada Bia, and it appeared in print in 1929, which was seven years after her death. And the workmanship, remember, she was rich. She's really, really rich. And when we go tomorrow, I'm hoping to see some of the amazing architecture that I've heard about, that her skills with design and picking things. She picked the best of everything. She could afford it. Why would she order a 12 candle chandelier from Germany only to go and go, let's pick, put another one on so it has 13, and apparently it's not very well attached. So why would somebody with unlimited funds, if she wanted a chandelier with 13 candles, wouldn't she do that? So I find that extremely odd. She could afford a custom one. She had made a custom one, a 12 candle custom one. And now back to some of the shenanigans on Wikipedia. Last October, a user named the 13th Spirit, or 13 Spirit added to the page that the 13 elements in the home were all added before Sally's death, except for the 13 hooks in the blue room. And that it was apparently verified that Sally did use a planchette, I guess I'm assuming for a Ouija board. So that was, of course, unsighted. This one lasted 20 minutes, that's unusual for Wikipedia, but it did get reverted. And what I love is if you look at the green at the bottom, you, when you're doing an edit, you're supposed to put in a reason as to why you put the edit in. So this person's reason was it added undeniable, inarguable, verifiable content beyond the power of opinion. Unsighted. 
<laughs> Her nonsensical construction concluded that stairs that lead to nowhere, doors that open to two-story drops, some doors open to solid walls. And as mentioned, the reason often cited for this crazy construction was because she was confusing her spirits. That's the most common thing I found. And these started as early as 1890, because they would see her building stuff up, tearing it down, building stuff up, tearing it down. What was the actual reality for this? It was not about spirits. It was because she was an inexperienced architect, and she was trying things. And she would just build a room at a time, and then she'd go, oh, I'd like to build another room around. Oh, it's blocking that. Oh, well, we'll just have to leave it. Or she would say, take it down. She had the money to do it, and she liked to employ people. She kept people employed during the 19, uh, 1990s when there was actually a depression in the area. And she kept people on and kept them working. So it was actually a good thing. She would have rooms built if they were not to her liking, and would add a new way, as I said, blocking the access of the door. And I think the most important thing, that, and you know, because one of the ones that they talk about a lot is these staircases that just go up to nowhere. And that's because there was an earthquake in 1906, the San Francisco earthquake. It was estimated to be 7.9 on a rolling magnitude scale. And it damaged this house tremendously. It used to go up to seven stories. And anything above the second story, in general, collapsed, was gone. So what did Sally do? She repaired as best she could. She did not rebuild. So she just cleared the debris, boarded it up, the missing, you know, the holes up to the other floor, boarded it up, and that's why you have the stairs to nowhere. There's a logical explanation. She's not crazy. And 1906, she was a lot older. Her health was declining still. So it was hard for her to keep it going. And so there's this claim that, and I read in the story, she built continuously around the clock for 38 years. One thing you now know, she kind of stopped at 1906. That was it. She never did much. She cleaned it up. She added a couple things. She added an elevator. She didn't do much to the house. People still lived there. Her staff still lived there. They looked after it. They did regular maintenance. That was it. And she feared death if stopped, if she stopped construction. Well, I think, again, we know that's not true because she stopped construction. And you saw the other one that wrote your paper that said if she didn't, you know, she could build other places. So the, the lore changed this time, not much lore does. So she took breaks for months. We, uh, we know she took a lot of breaks. She didn't go continuously. So not only did she stop in 1906, but if the weather wasn't right and it wasn't conducive to the type of construction she wanted to do, she would take a two, three, four month break. If her health was poor, she'd say, I need to take a break, I need to rest. There are letters to this effect where she dismisses everybody. So it was never continuous. And one of her, her companions, one of her dear companions, Miss Henrietta Service, who was with her until she died, she says that Sally never held any superstitious beliefs. And her relatives and some of her friends also say the same thing. This is an interesting one. She was trapped for several hours in her bedroom during the 1906 earthquake, screaming and calling for help for hours. And the reality is, we don't know. There's no evidence she was actually there, trapped, screaming. But there is evidence a few days before that she was at her Atherton home. And that's where she tended to reside a lot. So that's probably where she was. Could she have been there? Possibly, but there's no letters. Don't you think if you were in there and yelling and screaming and traffic, you'd write letters to your family to say, you know, she had family still back east that she corresponded with? Hey, this was an awful experience for her. There's nothing. There's a claim that she held patents and was an innovator. And she was actually an innovator. She actually, this enunciator was a brand new thing. Is it early telecom? Or, uh, in, Intercom. Intercom, thank you. Intercom. So early intercom, and there's often reference to three elevators. I couldn't find any reference to anything but one elevator that she put in in 1916, but it's possible that there, she added them instead of after the fact. And according to the San Jose Library, there's no evidence that she ever filed any patents. And this is a fun one with the presidents. That, you know, she spurned them. She turned them away. They showed up at her door. 
door, and she would not answer the door, especially with President Roosevelt. That's the most common story. And so it was 1901 that McKinley visited, and 1903 that Roosevelt visited. The reality is, she didn't even invite William. She was asked to invite him, and she said no, and the community was kind of mad at her. But she, I think she, her health was poor. Roosevelt had no interest at all in meeting her. She had no interest in meeting him. And the reason he didn't want to meet her is he was president and did not want to be seen as a victim or an easy, I guess, I don't know what the word is. You know what I'm trying to say. Guess what? He lost the election. <laughs> Way to go south. And this is a picture here of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company in 1891, a really big factory. And she was very financially astute. In 1889, her financial advisor, William Converse, who was then the president of the Repeating Arms Company, he died. And she decided after that she was going to do her own finances. Can you imagine being a woman at that time looking after her own finances? And she's a smart woman. She wasn't going to do it on her own. So she hired uh, a lawyer who she had used several times called Frank, Frank Lee. And in, I talked about how this, there was a financial crisis in the 1890s. So in 1893, the stock market crashed. She did okay. She lost money. But because of her decisions and her, she was very conservative with her decisions. She didn't do anything drastic. She was fine. She sailed through it. She was able to keep everybody employed. And she was okay. And it was profitable again. The uh, Winchester Marketing Repeating, the Winchester Repeating Farms Company. Oh my goodness. I'm trying to repeat myself. It was uh, profitable again by 1898. So she sailed through it. She was fine. And she was. Her other big thing, I've talked about it already, is her real estate. She did very well with her real estate, and many of her properties were rentals. So she was earning an income on her properties. Oh, I think I hit that twice today, or twice. Oh, maybe we pass. Oh, good things happen in threes, right? There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right, so post earthquake. So it, there was a big project she undertook, and this was really fascinating to me. She decided that after the earthquake, maybe we should build some canals in the Birmingham area and have docks and passages to people's wealthy homes so they could sail from one end side of the United States, go down to the Panama Canal, which was about to open in a couple of years, and then come back up and dock at their homes in Burlingham. And she designed and actually oversaw the construction of a system of canals. And so it got started. But unfortunately, uh, later on, well, we'll, we'll tell you what happened. Well, I, I'll tell you first. Her, uh, one of her, her reinsmen, you know, the horses, the guys that they drive the carts around? She brought her reinsman from Connecticut, and he died. And she kind of lost interest after that. But in the meantime, while she's building this, there was this crooked contractor who she hired to build these canals. And he also negotiated that he could live on one of her properties and pay rent. And then he didn't pay the rent. And not only that, he decimated many of her properties. He went and dug up the dirt and used it for sidewalks and other projects he had uh, contracts for. And there's a, a, a rumor that stated that half the sidewalks in Burlingham were made from the sand stolen from Winchester's Beach. <laughs> so what did she do about that? Sally sued. Oh, and one. She got him back. So she's, she didn't take anything. She didn't stand for anything. And next year is her philanthropy. I think this is really somewhat well known, maybe. But at the time when she was living, she, it was not well known. She did everything anonymously. How do we know now? Because there were meticulous records kept by her lawyer and by herself. So we know she donated to these places. She donated to the Red Cross, to the San Jose Relief Fund after the earthquake and to the safety redwoods. And she purchased a home for her Rainsman's family. So after he died, he was only 50 and he had a young family. And she supported that family until she died or maybe after. I think she named a lot of people in their will, so I'm sure they were well looked after. But her biggest donation was to her husband's legacy, which was to a tuberculosis 
hospital in, in Haven. And it was, initially she donated anonymously $300,000 towards the project. And eventually they did have to find out who she was because it ended up being millions of dollars that she donated. And she, went, she was too ill when they opened it. She was too ill at the time, so she was not able to go to the opening. And it was named the William Wirt. And I misspelled it. It should not be W-O-R-T on there. Look at that. I'm so good at spelling. It's W-I-R-T, Winchester Hospital, which is now part of, uh, I believe it's the Yale School of Medicine now. It's become part of that. So, some interesting shenanigans again on our kerfuffles on Wikipedia of people trying to redo. When I published the rewrite, immediately somebody went in and took everything out and put in all the lore again, which was quickly reverted by other people, not me, none of our team. Other people were looking out for the page. And a few weeks later, it was actually, what, the, what happens with Wikipedia when that happens, when there's constant fighting back and forth, is they block the page. And so they blocked it for a couple of days, and then a couple of weeks later, an actual employee of the house attempted these changes again. But again, they were immediately reverted. And I'll show you what the person wrote. She said, hi y'all, I will be making edits to this page due to some incorrect and inaccurate information. I am an employee at the Winchester History House, and many of the recent edits were made using one of the only biographies written about Sarah Winchester. That's the Mary Malfa book. And the author did not interview anyone affiliated with the house, and many of the edits to this page are opinions. So it's my opinion. Huh. <laughs> no citation needed, apparently. I have included one of the responses from another Wikipedia editor. This is not our, someone on our team. And it says, so in this case, we have sources listed. That's what I did. I have Joe Nicko, who I introduced you to, Mary Jo Ignafo, who's a historian, Brian Dunning, Katie Dowd, Colin Dickey, etc., writing in line with that scientific consensus, and also as experts who are, importantly, independent of monetary incentive to promote mystery, drama, superstition, hype, etc. Yeah. So it's, you know, yeah. 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 And I also want to show you how important Wikipedia is. I think it's a first line. What do we do when we don't know something? We go to Wikipedia. And since I've rewritten both of these pages, I did the Winchester Mystery House first, and then I did the Sarah Winchester page second. And I've had, as of last weekend, well, you know, almost seven, I'm getting close to 700,000 views, and 40,000 views for Sarah Winchester. And I don't know about you, but my Facebook page, TikTok, Instagram, I'm not getting that much attention. Yeah. <laughs> and I really like this because it's, it's behind the scenes, nobody knows who I am, I'm anonymous, except for you guys, and I'm not going to even shh, don't tell anybody. Uh, so it's, it's a great way to be an activist if you don't want limelight. I love it. It makes you feel good that I'm combating this misinformation. So after learning about the real story of Sally Winchester, and I'm going to ask you to think about what is more interesting, truth or fiction? In my opinion, learn, after learning about her story, I think the truth is far more interesting. She was an amazing woman. And this is on a book review that I found on Amazon, and I think it sums up my feelings more succinctly than I could write them. It says, although my lifelong illusion of who Mrs. Winchester was has been shattered by your book, I am glad for it. I find her actual story far more inspiring and a cautionary tale on the effects of journalism and the intolerance of intelligent women that history had to rewrite her story to make her seem unstable. So, what I would like to do is correct that, and let's celebrate Sally. Let's celebrate her life, which is a testament to strength in the face of a lot of adversity, which included the death of her daughter, husband, her declining health, and a lot of unfair accusations while she was living. It's time to celebrate these accomplishments and get rid of the false narratives that have survived for far too long. I believe that if Sally Winchester was alive today, I think she'd be a leader of a company, maybe, and even possibly a hopeful and architectural firm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's everything.
Yes, the walk with spirits, it is at 11.50. 11.50. Oh, five, 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 and the matching tour is at 1.20. Okay, 11.20. Okay, 1.20. 1.20 for the matching tour. It, but you can do that, like I said, it leaves every 15 minutes. You might even be able to get one before that, like the 1 o'clock, if you don't want to go on the other tour. So anyway, that's And then a you lot can just tour. hang out in the, in the yeah, restaurant. Yeah, we'll hang out at the restaurant. We're and we'll meet up there and we can share our experiences. Yeah, I honestly. really like, because you may get a different tour with a different tour guide mm -hmm. who will tell you something different. I think that would be... Curious. And there's a spell over here. Morgan? Yeah, so the, the slide about her inheritance, is that just re regarding inheritance? Because it seems like all the properties that she owned and all those donations yes. have taken a lot more than the two million something to raise money. Well, that's a good point. So his question is that inheritance value, did that include all her properties that she ended up purchasing? Is that correct? Um, just basically, all those things seem like a lot more than two million. So, yeah. so is it just regarding like she didn't get forty million inheritance? It was like well, she know, got she, property with her husband. Yeah, she got her inheritance and then she started investing in property and she started and then the property values went up. Oh okay. Yeah, so she that's why she was so astute. She ended up, as I say, I think she was constantly buying and selling properties. So it was hard to get an exact count at any time. So at one point, I think she had 11 properties, and then sometimes, and then briefly it would be 12, and then she'd sell it off. And so she was constantly doing this kind of thing. And but her initial inheritance is exactly what I said. So it's a good question. But I think she earned all the rest. You're absolutely right. I think it would definitely be more than the two million dollars today, yeah. for sure. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. No, no, this is really. Carol. But what do you think? of the architecture of the house? What, could it survive as an attraction on its architectural merits? That's a good question. So I asked Joe question. Nickel that question too. Mm -hmm. And so many of these sites, in order to exist, you know, to keep a roof over the heads and so on, don't they have to dabble in this world of spiritualism yeah. and, and, and they hit the paranormal community because maybe the history's not interesting enough and maybe the building will deteriorate? It's a great question. Joe said, uh, Joe Nickel, I believe he told me that, um, you know, it's a, it's a difficult question. Yeah. And, and to be honest, because this information about her being a spiritualist and being crazy and mad, that's part of the lore, that's part of the history of the house. I don't want that to disappear. I want it to be presented as part of the lore. That the reality is, these, this is why this exists because she was experimenting and she was a pioneer for her time to celebrate her. But yeah, discuss it. Have your seance tour, your ghost walks. I think that's actually appropriate considering the history of the house. Maybe not when it first opened, <laughs> but at this point, a hundred years later, it is part of the history and it's interesting. But I think that her actual history, considering she was a woman of her time who couldn't vote, and she took control of her destiny, essentially, is a, is a very unique story for the time. What was the deal with the spider web windows? Oh, the spider webs. You guys will see them a lot in the illustrations. Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. What about the spider so web spider, windows? So she's asking what's the deal with the spider web windows. So I believe in some of the spider web windows, there's 13 spiders, I think. And the spider web windows were not unique to Sarah Winchester. That was a fad or a trend of the time. So most wealthy houses had those spidery windows. There's nothing creepy about it. <laughs> so, but you know, I'm really excited to see them. Right? I have a question that I remember hearing all the time on the tours as a photographer myself, that they, she would not have a picture taken. And the only picture that well, this obviously is not true because we saw her picture. Is <laughs> was one of her as an old woman in a carriage. Yeah. Somebody snuck the picture as like through the bushes. Somebody yeah. took a picture of her that she would not have a picture taken. What do you, you know about that? Not a lot. I, there are. I know Mary Jo Ignacio did get more pictures from the the house and the, her staff. She's got a lot more of her staff. There's not a lot of pictures around of her. I'm guessing. I know Joe Nickel guesses that she was just a, worried about her appearance. She was all hunched over with her arthritis. Her fingers were gnarled. Her, you know, her feet were not in great shape. She had trouble walking, and she had missing teeth. 
So I think she was self-conscious. That's Joe Nichols' guess, and I think it's a fair guess. But yeah, I don't, plus they, don't the pictures may not have survived. It was a different type of yeah. photography that time. Yeah. And even if you are wealthy and you have, it's a lot of people don't like having their picture taken. Yeah. You know, that we didn't have press paparazzi around. I, I always thought it was a little odd that one of her workmen would be peering through the bushes to take a picture of her in that time. In the 19, early 1900s, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think he used a, like a Polaroid or an instant camera <laughs> with a, like a telephoto lens on it. It would have been a big so setup. A cell phone, yeah. A yeah. cell phone, yeah. No, nobody had that. I think it would have been a big camera. Oh, like, yeah. I had poking camera. through the bushes. Yeah. Well, at that picture, the one with the, her in the, she was younger at that time. I guess, I'm guessing that it was actually a planned photo. And that was when the house hadn't undergone, it's one of the few remaining photos of the house before construction. So it's one, it's the original farmhouse, which is a, a seven room farmhouse or something. All right. So I think that's the message of it. I'm going to end that there because we want to try to stay in time. I have some built-in things in case I have to, but I want to thank Adrienne Hill not only for coming all the way from Calgary, but the amazing work she has done. <laughs>